But we're going to start tonight right here in San Diego, California, in the fancy Rancho Santa Fe neighborhood in San Diego, California, where in March 1997, the local sheriff's office got a tip that something was very wrong inside one specific mansion in Rancho Santa Fe. Inside that mansion, they found 39 cult members, all dressed identically, all tucked away neatly in beds, all dead. It was a mass suicide. Their cult was called the Heaven's Gate. And as best as anybody could figure, the Heaven's Gate cult members killed themselves because they thought that doing so would somehow convey them to an alien spacecraft that they wanted to be on, that they believed to be trailing behind a particular comet. It was absolutely bizarre and tragic. 39 people killed in that cult mass suicide. The people who died in that Rancho Santa Fe mansion, though, were all members of the cult. At least this cult, in its mass suicide, did not try to take anybody else out with them. That was not the case in Jonestown. Jonestown was a cult that was founded in the Midwest. It grew hugely in the San Francisco Bay Area, and then it eventually moved to South America in 1976. The Jonestown cult is, of course, remembered for its mass suicide in Guyana, uh, two years later, in 1978, 900 people dead. But not every Jonestown cult member who died made a decision to die. It was not all suicide, including the cold-blooded murder of a U.S. congressman and an NBC News reporter and an NBC News cameraman and a photographer for the San Francisco Examiner and a member of the group who was trying to defect back to the U.S., those people were all shot to death on the airstrip in Guyana while they were trying to leave to get the story out. Five people killed, nine other people shot and injured, including now Congresswoman Jackie Speer of California. Even the cults that we think of as suicide cults do not always just want to kill themselves. They often want to take somebody else with them when they go. In 1995, it was the apocalyptic pseudo-Christian death cult, Om Shinrikyo, that turned out to be not just foretelling the end of the world, they were also kind of working on the end of the world themselves. They'd worked on things like trying to develop a mass spraying system for the botulin toxin, so they could spray it over large numbers of people, maybe from moving vehicles. They had worked with cholera, they had worked with anthrax. When their compound was eventually raided in Japan, it turned out they had managed to get themselves not only explosives, not only all those toxins, but also things like, oh hey, a Russian Mi-17 military helicopter. So who knows what their larger plans were? But what they did do was this. Through the night, anti-chemical warfare troops searched Tokyo subway stations for more nerve gas containers, but found none. Searched for clues as to who would have done this. Terrorized a subway system that carries seven and a half million people a day, twice that of New York. Seven people are dead, including a worker who tried to remove a suspicious container and died instantly. More than a dozen critically injured, over 3,400 were treated, some choking for air, some were blinded. It got dark all around, and I couldn't see. I saw something on the train wrapped in plastic. Investigators found six containers wrapped in plastic, and doctors said the poison was sarin, a nerve agent that cripples the nervous system. A drop can kill almost instantly. In the end, that sarin attack that the Japanese death cult slash terrorist group released on the Tokyo subway in March 1995, uh, in the end, that sarin attack killed 13 people. It sent thousands of people to the hospital. Law enforcement then realized at the time that that same group had also been responsible for a previously unsolved gas attack on another Japanese site a year earlier, about three hours west of Tokyo. That one killed fewer people, but it was the same basic idea. The sarin that they used in both instances was homemade. The second batch was apparently stronger than the first batch. Authorities say it is only because the group had not rigged a better means of dispersing the poison that they were not able to kill hundreds more people. Sarin was invented by German scientists in the late 1930s. They were trying to build a stronger pesticide at the time, but they came up with this nerve agent. For anybody waiting for me to mispronounce something spectacularly in this show, I can tell you that its proper name is isopropyl methylphosphonofluoridate, and I'm sure that's not how you say it. 
Um, sarin is a chemical that does not occur naturally in the world. You have to make it in a lab. It's considered one of the most toxic substances on Earth. It is 500 times more deadly than cyanide. The deadliness of this drug was not lost on the scientists who developed it. They promptly turned it over to the German military, who promptly turned it into a weapon for use in World War II, although the Nazis did not end up using it in combat. Sarin works essentially by jamming the nervous system. It causes the synapses to fire the same message over and over again. And that has lots of effects on the body, none of them good. One of the things it does is pretty, pretty quickly, it, it paralyzes the muscles that make breathing possible. Exposure to enough sarin, and it does not take much, can lead to fatal suffocation within minutes. Sarin, again, which does not occur in nature, which has to be made by man, it makes a terrifying weapon. Human skin absorbs sarin, so it can kill on contact. In liquid form, it is clear and odorless. It mixes well with water, which of course makes it a potent poison that can be added to food or water or anything else. It of course can also be used in chemical warheads. This would be a cluster munition. Sarin is not, however, the most stable compound in the world. The process of putting it on a missile or a rocket or in cluster munitions can sometimes mean relatively complicated weapon design. Lots of countries have sarin, or, or have had it at some point. The United States and Russia both used to mass produce sarin during the Cold War. In the war between Iran and Iraq that raged through most of the 1980s, Saddam Hussein used sarin in combat against the Iranians. He also famously used sarin and mustard gas both. Yeah, the same mustard gas from World War I. Saddam used both of them, both sarin and mustard gas, in 1988 against his own Iraqi people. He bombed the civilian Iraqi Kurdish population in the northern Iraqi city of Halabja. He bombed them with sarin and mustard gas. The death toll from that attack was estimated to be in the thousands. Sarin is technically illegal now. An International Chemical Weapons Convention banned it in 1993. But not every country in the world signed on to that convention. Angola, North Korea, Egypt, the new country of South Sudan, Somalia, and Syria have not touched the chemical weapons convention that banned sarin. And that last country there, Syria, is thought to have some of the largest stocks of sarin in the whole world. Syria reportedly started making chemical weapons in earnest in the 1970s. They really stepped it up during the 1980s. It was a strategic decision made by the Assad government. For whatever reason now, the Assad government now has huge stockpiles of chemical weapons. In the bloody civil war that has been raging for two years now in Syria, there are frequent allegations that the Syrian government is using its chemical weapons against the rebels, against its own civilians. The Syrian government itself has even alleged that chemical weapons were used by the rebels, not by the government, but by the other side. But either way, it should be noted that the use of chemical weapons is much easier to allege than it is to prove. And I mean that in the technical sense. It is hard to prove if chemical weapons have been used, especially if you're trying to prove it from a distance. This is not the same kind of situation it was in Iraq where the debate is about whether or not this particular guy has chemical weapons. In Syria, it's clear that they do. We know that they have stockpiles of chemical weapons. The question is whether or not they have been used. It's not that easy to tell, especially from far away. Tear gas and other riot control gases that are not counted as chemical weapons technically, the use of those can cause some of the same superficial effects as chemical weapons, especially if they're used in really concentrated doses. Chemical contamination on the battlefield or in besieged areas where traditional weapons are being used, that form of chem chemical contamination can be hard to distinguish from the effects of chemical weapons. The way you really tell, if you really want to be sure if chemical weapons have been used or not, is by taking physical samples. Physicians for Human Rights, the American Human Rights Group, uh, was one of the first groups in the world to prove that Saddam really had used sarin and mustard gas against the Iraqi Kurds at Halabja. They were not able to conclusively prove it, though, until four years after the attack, four years after the fact, when they were finally able to collect soil samples that showed trace evidence of the elements that sarin breaks down to over time. Well, today, I say all that because today, knowing that much about sarin, knowing how sarin is used, knowing how you can tell if it has been used, knowing that much about sarin today suddenly became really important for all of us, for understanding what it means for us as a country that our defense secretary today said this very carefully worded thing. The U.S. intelligence community 
assesses with some degree of varying confidence that the Syrian regime has used chemical weapons on a small scale in Syria, specifically the chemical agent sarin. As I've said, the intelligence community has been assessing information for some time on this issue. And the decision to reach this conclusion was made within the past 24 hours. Some degree of varying confidence. What does that mean? Because if, if we're saying now that this country, Syria, has used chemical weapons in this war, where our president, President Obama, has said that would be a red line. That would be a game changer in terms of thinking about the United States potentially getting involved somehow in that war over there that we have thus far stayed out of. So when you say it has been assessed with some degree of varying confidence that they've crossed that red line, well, what the heck does that mean? Does that mean that some U.S. intelligence agencies think that sarin got used and some of them don't? How do we know? What are we basing this on? I mean, forgive me for splitting the hairs, but if the split in this hair is the difference between America going to war again and us not going to war again, then this hair needs splitting. The letter that the White House sent to Congress today does add this important detail. Quote, the assessment is based in part on physiological samples. Physiological samples. Okay, well, that would imply that they have physically tested something to come to this conclusion. They're not relying on diagnosing it from afar just by sight or by allegations, right? They've tested something. There was a follow-up call with reporters today to explain what this all means, but the White House would not elaborate at all on what these physiological samples are or what they showed or how definitive their results were. There's been some other reporting today that maybe it was blood samples of people who were gassed by sarin, blood samples smuggled out of Syria and tested by U.S. analysts. That was reported at the Danger Room blog at Wired Magazine today. There's also been other reporting this week from the New York Times quoting Syrian rebels saying that Americans, the CIA specifically, were asking the Syrian rebels to go collect samples. But that's the reporting. We, we don't know. U.S. officials are not explaining it yet. So we have the mealy qualified assertion, right? But we don't really have any proof. If there were proof, President Obama has said repeatedly that that would cross a red line in terms of the possibility of U.S. intervention. Another war in the Middle East, right next door to Iraq. With war and peace on the line, with potentially American war and peace on the line. The official word from the White House today about this sarin issue uh, is that they want UN inspectors to be allowed access to the sites where people say chemical weapons were used. They want UN inspectors to be able to test properly, to test the soil, to test the victims, to determine conclusively whether it really did happen and it's not just the same old allegations we've been hearing for months from people who want us to go to war in Syria. The line from the White House is let the UN inspectors in to determine the truth. Is this starting to sound familiar to you? Here at home today, a senator named John McCain reacted to this news by saying that to him, it's obvious this is already a slam dunk case, that WMDs were used, so let's go. Let's start arming the rebels. Let's start shooting down Syrian planes right now. He said today the intel's good enough for him already. I assure you that we are not just reenacting an old script for old time's sake to celebrate the opening of the George Bush Presidential Library today. I assure you that this is new news, just breaking 